Old asylums were known for mistreating their patients. Living conditions were horrible, patients weren't properly cared for, and the nurses didn't really care about their job or even the patients as long as their job paid the bills. There are hospitals in which these events are well documented in articles, books, and histories. Much of the abuse that occurred in these hospitals were a product of megalomaniacal physicians, poorly tested treatments, and an overburdened mental health system. Nobody was trying to screw up along the way necessarily, but you know, you get what you get. We may have moved past the ice pick lobotomy as a cure-all, but the horrors of the past remain. Before we begin, make sure you hit that subscribe button to get notified every day for more amazing content. With that being said, let's begin. Number 5. Metropolitan State Hospital there are plenty of disturbing tales surrounding Metropolitan State Hospital, which opened in Waltham, Massachusetts in 1930. On the grounds of the hospital sat the Gabler Children's Center, which many of its former residents have described as being like a prison. It was a home for the mentally ill that operated from the 1920s until 1992, when it was closed in January as a result of the state's cost-cutting policy of closing its mental hospitals and moving patients into private and community-based settings. Sounds really nice. I'm sure it didn't work out great for a lot of them. Once the doors were closed, it then remained abandoned for the next 15 years. At its peak, the facility had a patient population of nearly 2,000 people. Children that were sent here were strictly disciplined and frequently sedated, and there are many tales of accidental poisoning by the pediatric psychiatric patients during the 1960s. This insane asylum has one scary tale in which the Metropolitan Psychiatric Ward is best known for, and it earned the nickname, the Hospital of Seven Teeth. And this is how it happened. In 1978, a patient named Anna Marie Davy, Davy, not sure, went for a walk around the grounds and never returned. It turns out that patients were not only victims of the psychiatrists or nurses in the hospital, but were also victims of each other. In 1980, Anna Marie Davy's disappearance was solved when her killer, a fellow patient named Melvin Wilson, brought police to the three separate graves where he had buried parts of her hacked up body. As if dismembering her wasn't enough, Wilson kept seven of Davy's teeth as a souvenir. The asylum did have a patient graveyard, which is very creepy just on its own. Although the asylum's main campus was demolished, deeper into the woods, the patient graveyard remains intact. Given that almost 350 former patients were buried in the site beneath unmarked graves, many believe that restless spirits still haunt the asylum's grounds. Visitors to the graveyard have reported sudden temperature drops, as well as the eerie sounds of children singing. Ugh. One such restless spirit might be former patient Anne-Marie DeVees, who was murdered in the asylum in 1978 by a fellow patient. The underground tunnels connecting the asylum's buildings have also seen their share of scary. Visitors have reported hearing voices in the tunnels and seeing hands grabbing at their feet as they walked. Number 4. State Lunatic Hospital at Danvers this is another Massachusetts mental hospital that has had a bit of spooky history. Interestingly enough, this asylum at Danvers, Massachusetts was a psychiatric hospital that was built in 1874 on Hathorn Hill, where the Salem Witch Trials judge John Hathorn once lived. It's said to have been an inspiration for H.P. Lovecraft's Arkham Sanatorium, and Danvers is also mentioned in Lovecraft's stories Pickman's Model and The Shadow Over Innsmouth, and it served as the setting for the film Session 9. The exterior even appears in the asylum level of the game Painkiller. This thing is everywhere. The hospital was designed to house 450 patients suffering from various mental illnesses. When it first opened in May of 1878, under the name the State Lunatic Hospital at Danvers, it was a one-of-a-kind facility. By the 1920s and 1930s, the hospital started to suffer from severe overcrowding and a lack of funding. The number of patients grew to over 2,000, while the size of staff remained relatively the same. As a result, the quality of care began to deteriorate as the overwhelmed staff struggled to control the massive number of patients. Patients were soon subjected to lobotomies, shock therapy, and, quote, special garments, presumably straight jackets, as means of control. The daily population of the hospital in 1939 was 2,360, an increase from the previous year, and the number of patients who died in the hospital that year 
totaled 278. I wonder if they've got their own graveyard too. Obviously, there was something terribly wrong with so many deaths happening in just one year. There just wasn't enough staff to take care of all the mentally ill. The staff was at a loss for how to control the patients who were sick and dirty from their lack of care. Sometimes the patients died out of the staff member's sight and weren't discovered until days later, rotting away in some forgotten room. Eventually, all of the nightmarish trappings of asylums were introduced at this very asylum. Solitary confinement, straitjackets, electroshock therapy, which gets a bad rap but was likely overused as a means to control patients rather than as a mode of treatment, and of course, the lobotomy. Physician Walter Freeman performed the United States' first transorbital lobotomy in 1936, and many large psychiatric hospitals took to the procedure like an ice pick to an eye socket using it to treat everything from daydreaming and backaches to delusions and major depression. Physician Walter Freeman performed the United... Nope, I got in the wrong place. Danvers is often given the dubious title of the birthplace of the prefrontal lobotomy for its use and refinement of the procedure. While some patients certainly saw stunning benefits from this so-called miracle treatment, many others had adverse effects. Who'd have thought? Visitors to the hospital in the late 1940s described the patients as aimlessly wandering the halls or vacantly staring at walls, perhaps a result of both their poor treatment by the staff and their various medical interventions. It must have been a terrifying time for any patient in this asylum. Portions of the hospital were shuttered starting in 1969, with most of it closed by 1985 and the entire campus shut down in 1992. Number 3. Trenton State Hospital The New Jersey State Lunatic Asylum, also later called Trenton State and now Trenton Psychiatric Hospital. Unlike Danvers State, it was better remembered for its medical abuses than for its well-intentioned beginnings. Dr. Henry Cotton became the director of the hospital in 1907 and eventually instituted treatments based on his own theories of mental illness. On the one hand, Cotton, who trained at Johns Hopkins under the eminent Swiss-born psychiatrist Adolf Meyer, had a very progressive attitude toward care of his patients. He did away with the mechanical restraints that so many other hospitals used to control patients, introduced occupational therapy, increased the staff, and ensured that the nurses would prevent violence against the patients, and instituted daily staff meetings about patient care. On the other hand, Cotton developed a dangerous theory about mental illness, one that turned his hospital into a house of horrors. After it was confirmed in 1913 that the spiroket bacteria that causes syphilis could also cause psychiatric symptoms, Cotton began to suspect that all mental illness was caused by bodily infections and that the only way then to cure the patient was to remove the offending infection. In 1917, he began removing patients' teeth, even in cases where x-rays showed no evidence of infection. He soon moved on to other body parts. Gallbladder, stomachs, ovaries, testicles, tracts of colon, uteruses. Cotton claimed a cure rate of 85%, but in reality, his surgeries had an unconscionably high mortality rate. And he didn't always obtain consent from patients or family members, and in fact, sometimes performed these removals despite their protests. What's perhaps more disturbing than Cotton's actual practice of these excisions is that he didn't perform them in secret. No, he published papers. He gave presentations of his work. When Meyer sent another psychiatrist to report on the operations at Trenton State, he initially suppressed her report, allowing Cotton to continue his gruesome work. It wasn't just a single arrogant doctor who was at fault, but also an institution that allowed him to continue his maiming. Cotton remained at Trenton until 1930, three years before his death. However, the tooth-pulling practice, somehow, remained in place until 1960. Number 2. Topeka State Hospital There's one story from Topeka State Hospital that's sure to make your skin crawl. According to the Topeka Capital Journal, a reporter visited the facility at some point during the early 20th century and saw a patient who had been strapped down for so long that his skin had begun to grow over his restraints. Other patients were chained up while naked for months at a time. For many residents at that time, however, life offered a different but similar sort of hell, even if they were unrestrained an unending boredom. 
Patients were given nothing to do, nothing to stimulate their minds, and so they sat in rocking chairs in the hallway all day, rocking and staring and doing little else. Fortunately, in 1948, Kansas Governor Frank Carlson, responding to reports of overcrowding and deplorable conditions, convened a panel to study the problem. The state legislature ended up doubling the appropriations for mental hospitals and the rocking chairs were removed from the hallway. Psychiatrists and psychologists began volunteering at the hospital, seeing patients and organizing a department of psychology at the hospital. In 1949, the hospital hired its first social worker, who prepared patients for their eventual release. Although the hospital did stumble in later years due to funding cutbacks, by the late 1960s, Topeka State was viewed as a leading psychiatric facility. However, the hospital lost its Medicare and Medicaid accreditation in 1988 and, like so many hospitals, lost patients to community-based programs during the 1990s. In 1997, the hospital closed its doors for good, but the toothless ghosts of this asylum are surely walking the halls. Number 1. Whittingham Hospital Whittingham Psychiatric Hospital was built in 1873 and was the largest in the United Kingdom, and the second largest in Europe. At its peak, it housed over 3,500 patients and employed over 500 staff. It was a pioneer in the use of electroencephalograms, or EEG, duh, where tests are done to monitor the electrical activity in the brain. But the hospital's legacy was forever tainted in 1965, when a series of bizarre allegations against the staff of the St. Luke's Division, which is the mental or psychiatric ward, began to emerge. Over the next few years, these allegations began to spill out into the mainstream press, and the papers jumped on claims that patients were fed mixed-together food, otherwise known as slops, and that some were only given bread and jam to eat. Many patients claimed that they were locked outside in the courtyard during bad weather, and that they were put to bed wearing only sheets, and that some patients were locked out of the bathrooms. One patient alleged that staff members would sometimes apply a wet towel treatment to patients, twisting a wet towel around a patient's neck until the patient lost consciousness. Others claimed that patients were punched and subsequently locked in a storeroom. One claim said that two nurses had poured alcohol into the slippers of one patient and the dressing gown of another and then set both of them on fire. The allegations were routinely denied by the staff, but both the head nurse and the matron retired as a result of the scandal. An official inquiry into the matter came after a nurse was convicted of manslaughter after one of the elderly patients he had assaulted died. The hospital closed in 1995 and most of the buildings on the premises are still standing. Interestingly enough, the information that was on the hospital's website about this place and its history was removed. There have been tales of ghost stories and haunting around the facility, and one story says that while people were touring the asylum, a shadowy figure appeared that looked as if it was holding a newborn baby. What's not widely known is that becoming pregnant out of wedlock as a teenager would get you a one-way ticket to the asylum, and this happened more than you might think. We might still have a lot of problems these days, but we've come very far. Alright, Top Fivers, if you haven't already, make sure to visit our other channel, The Brilliant, for even more interesting list videos that'll blow your mind. Oh, but I'm warning you, the videos over on The Brilliant are extremely addicting to watch as well. There will be a link in the description to the channel, so make sure to come and visit us. Or you can go to our latest video popping up on screen right now. Oh, and have you visited thefinestpost.com to enjoy the most amazing articles you will ever get to read?